Welcome to episode 68 of the Hoops Fix podcast with me, your host, Sam Nita, full-time British basketball advocate. There was some big news in the UK basketball world in the last couple of weeks when Holly Winterburn, one of the top-rated prospects to come out of the UK in years, arguably one of the greatest uh, junior British players to ever be produced, uh, made the decision to sign a three-year deal in the WBBL with the Leicester Riders whilst also continuing her, edu- continuing her education at Loughborough University. Um, Holly spent last season at Oregon, uh, one of the highest rated female basketball programs in the States. Um, Just to give context, she did win a Pac-12 regular season championship, a Pac-12 conference championship, tournament championship. Um, And not only that, three of her teammates have gone on to be drafted in the top 10 uh, of the WNBA draft uh, this summer. Just to give an indication of the level that she was playing at, playing in front of thousands of fans every single weekend uh, and has made the decision to come back to the UK which uh, I think a lot of people looked at and was like, like wow, and that's, that was my initial reaction to the news. But as you'll hear in this interview, there's a lot more uh, that goes into being a basketball player than just uh, what happens between those those four lines on the court. Um, you know, I think it's very easy for us to look at everything for a basketball frame and actually not realise that uh, basketball players are people as well. And um, sometimes you have to optimise for other things than just basketball. Uh, and I think her decision is not only hugely courageous, but also hugely admirable. And I think more people need to make decisions that are optimised around their own happiness uh, rather than their work or basketball or whatever it might be. Anyway, before we do get into this week's show, as always, please take two seconds to check out our Patreon account, patreon.com forward slash H-O-O-P-S-F-I-X. There you can start to give us a monthly contribution of a few quid, just a few quid. You won't even notice it leaving your account, but it'll make a big difference to the things that we're trying to do. If everybody that listened or watched this podcast took two seconds to give us donation every single month, it would fund everything we're doing and allow us to move away from doing freelance work and just focus purely on putting out content on Hoops Fix, which is the goal. As always, uh, you can reach out to me on every single social media platform at HoopsFix. You can reach out to me personally on my email address, sam at hoopsfix.com, if you want a bit more private interaction. And of course, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, do let me know what you think in the comments. Let me know what you think about uh, Holly's decision and how you think uh, it could impact the landscape of British basketball moving forward. Um, Anyway, that is enough from me. Here is this week's show with Holly Winterburn. Holly, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. There's obviously a, a lot to talk about um, and some big news that, that came out recently, which I'm, I'm sure we'll get onto. But I don't want to just jump straight into the into the meaty stuff, um, but actually kind of go more into your story from, from the early days uh, as well uh, through until until now. So we can kind of give a bit, bit more context for people of, of sort of your journey, I guess. Um, mm-hmm. So you started playing basketball in North Ants. Um can you uh, kind of go through with us like how you first were exposed to basketball, how you first picked up a ball, and what made you start playing in the first place? Um, I started at the school. That's where I started. There was um, a guy called Mark Spatcher ran a club called Hot Shots, and he would go in, come into like loads of different schools on like lunch times. And I started there, and I did that for loads of years with my friends. It was just a fun thing. And then one of my friends joined Northampton. He was a boy. He played on like the under twelve team. So I was, um, I went along with him one day, and I like started playing with the boys and stuff, and I really enjoyed it. And then, yeah, I just went from there. And then we like they formed a girls team and stuff. So yeah. So how old were you uh, at this point? When I joined Northampton, I was I think eleven, ten or eleven. Um, but I was playing in school for a few years before that. And were you playing other sports as well? Or was it was it purely basketball? Yeah, I played a lot of sports. My um, I played soccer from when I was like three years old. Like I was, I always loved that, and I played for a lot of different teams, and that was always like my main thing. And then I started playing them both together, and then it got to a point where I had to choose one of them, and I chose basketball. What do you think gave basketball the edge? Like, what what made you prefer it to to soccer, football? Because that's right, it. <laughs> <laughs> I was better at it, so I just I felt like I could go further in it. And there is a different like vibe to basketball because women's soccer in England, there at the time there was wasn't really any women's teams. I was still playing with the boys, so it got to a stage where I was too old to play with the boys because they were like getting so strong. So then, and I did enjoy basketball more. So yeah. At what point did you kind of start realizing? I'm pretty decent at this, you know, compared to my peers or, you know, equivalents of, of the same age? Um, 
Well, I think when I first got picked for like the England development squads, because you go for like regionals and stuff like that. And I think it was, I guess, when I first got picked for uh, England under 15s, I was like, because playing for your national team to be picked for the first time is such a huge deal. And I didn't really know what I expected. But at that point, I was thinking like, yeah, um, that I could go somewhere in this. From that age, were you, uh, did you have one eye on, you know, I want to be a future pro, this is what I want my career to be? Or was it very much still just about the love of the game and just the sort of the purity of it? I think, yeah, I didn't, I didn't know America was an option. I didn't know really what professional options there were. I just did it because I did love to do it. And um, my friends played and I like went to school at home. Then I went to basketball and I just loved it. So it was never a, OK, I'm going to do this and train really hard to get a scholarship. It was just do it and have fun. Did you have uh, sort of inspirations, role models that you were looking up to at that point, um, whether it be female or, or male players that kind of you'd seen, whether it's come through your local area or actually just on a GB stage or even on an international stage, players that you were looking to and saying, you know, they're amazing and that's kind of how good I want to be or, or where I want to work towards? Um, it depends on what age, because I think when I first joined Northampton, I was a couple of age groups down, but I had, um, they had a age group and had Sarah Round, uh, Rache Walton, Caitlin Stewart, and they were like going to the final fours and stuff. So it was kind of a, at first it was, I want to try and get into that team and play with them because they're a lot older and they kind of just took me along with them. And then I guess when I got older, it was Gabby, Savannah, and because they were playing a few age groups above me. And then now, really, it's people like Joe Leader and stuff like that. Were you having communication with uh, these players, you know, whether it's Savannah or, or whoever, kind of when you were, you know, 14, 15? It's, it's, it's so funny because normally when I have these conversations, the people I'm talking to are kind of at the end of their careers rather than still very much uh, <laughs> at the beginning. Um, so I'm very aware that you can still be in that situation where there's players that you look up to and, and rumbles and everything else. But, you know, rewinding sort of five, six years, um, you know, were you, were you in any type of communication um, with those players that you were looking up to and, uh, you know, asking them for advice or, or getting sort of guidance. I noticed, you know, in your conversation with Siobhan, uh, you did speak about sort of role models and the importance now that you feel of, of wanting to be able to be in a situation where, you know, younger players can come to you and talk to you about your experience and stuff like that. But yeah, flipping it on its head, like for you coming through, how was that experience? Um, I think obviously because I was training with the girls in Northampton, they were like someone I just wanted to be as good as. But I think I don't think I really knew about anyone like in the top junior programs or the senior team when I first got into the uh, team I think when I first went to England under 15s it was Matt Harbour was the coach and he put like a picture of Joe Leadham on the screen and was like who can name her and no one could and she was obviously the best player like we had and none of us knew her and it was kind of a bit of a the kind of the room went silent and it was awkward but yeah do you think there's a greater awareness now because of maybe the rise of social media and the internet uh, of sort of like the senior team for the younger players. Like, do you think if you were to get, you know, say the under 15s now in a room, you know, flash up, whether it's Joe Leadham or Temi or whatever on the screen, do you think there would be a greater awareness of who they are and kind of what they've done? Or do you still think there is a bit of a disconnect between the seniors and the juniors coming through? I, I don't think. I think if you ask like people my age and obviously, but people younger than me, I, I don't think so. I don't know. I could be wrong, but I think they would more know people like me, like Savannah, like Lauren, like Gabby, just because on social media, like some of them follow you, but I don't think they know to follow the older ones. I don't know. I could be wrong, but like, cause they don't have Twitter and stuff. And that's where the main GB basketball stuff is. Um, I don't, I think there is a big disconnect there. So your journey, uh, one of the things, one of the things uh, John John Collins mentioned uh, when I spoke to him was that uh, at fourteen you ended up representing the Division Two uh, women's team uh, because of some injuries and stuff, and it was quite clear at that point that you know you were you were better than some of the the senior players. Um, in your mind, you know when you think back to sort of being fourteen, fifteen years old and, and doing things like representing senior in senior competition, were you like? I'm better than a lot of players that are 
you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine years older than me. Um, were you aware of that? Or were you very much just like, yeah, I'm just doing my thing, just go, <laughs> going through the motions and kind of seeing how it goes? Um, I don't know. I think when in the moment, I kind of was just doing it and just enjoying it. And I, there was like, sometimes if I like didn't get played or something, I was like, oh, like I'm good enough to play. I play because I could go and score a lot of points in my own age group. So I was like, well, if I can do that there, why can't I do it there? But I think really for me, it was just, I went along with it. I just, they were really super nice to me, all the like senior players. So I just thought, I'll just go along with it, do what they want me to do. And yeah, not cause any problems. The move to to Leicester, uh, when when did that happen? And sort of what, what made you decide to sort of make that switch? Um, it was because cause I was a few years younger than like Rache's class. I was two years younger. They were all moving off to like Charmwood Barking and they were all kind of going their separate ways. And I then had nothing, no one to like play with to like challenge me. So really the, the women's side of the club was like, there wasn't really much for me to stay for. So I was kind of a bit stuck. I didn't know what I was going to do because at this point I could have just stopped playing because if, Leicester say hadn't been so close there wouldn't have been a team for me to play for and I might have just like it just could have fizzled out but I had um Josh Merrington was my assistant coach for the under 16s the year we were in division a that was the year like I was kind of um looking for somewhere and he was the, the coach of Charmwood so he kind of put me in touch with Matt who I knew from England anyway and yeah and we just it was about an hour drive. Like my parents had to drive me three, four times a week, so I wouldn't have been able to do it without them because uh, the trains and stuff aren't great between uh, Northampton and Leicester. But yeah, it just came around from there, and yeah. And you were you you were practicing with them for a year before you actually came to Charmwood, right? Is that is that correct? Uh, two years. For two years. Wow. Two years. Yeah. And who were you were you practicing with the WBBL team like? Who were you playing with when you were when you were travelling there? Uh, just the WBL team, yeah. And how how did you find that? How how was that as a as a bright eyed fifteen year old, you know, kind of being thrown in with the Lions, so to speak? Um, you know, how did you how did you feel? How was your mentality going in? Like, were you nervous or were you fine about it? Uh, and how did you feel that you were kind of like competing and matching up? Um, I I wouldn't say I was nervous because. Like, I don't I don't remember a lot of it, but I kind of just went, I just turned up and I never really thought too much about it. I just went and played. So because I when I started, I just had elbow surgery. So I kind of got to see training and stuff for the first like five or six weeks. So I could kind of get my head around it. Um, but yeah, like they just became my teammates. I never saw myself as a younger player with them. I just saw myself as one of them. And that's how I practiced really and like they would always treat me the same as they would do a senior player and I guess that was hard at some point because I was like over 10 years younger than some of them but I, I got used to it and like my minutes started to creep up and I got better and better so did do you think that uh sort of being around so many older players at such a young age kind of well I guess you know obviously it would it would help with your development on the floor but also in terms of your maturity and stuff off the floor uh do you feel like it 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 sort of accelerated that more quickly than it might have been if you were just playing only with your peers uh i think it's like a different type of maturity because they would like i would i was 13 so i'd still be a kid and like talk about kiddie stuff i guess and they would be some of them would be like shut up volley but then others would like kind of joke around with me but then the stuff like you're there on time like you practice this well you run to the baseline you touch the baseline stuff like that that kids maybe don't get like forced to do like I was forced to do that so now it's just like a habit when you look back on your that initial stint uh with with Leicester um what are sort of the standout moments memories for you do you was there any like kind of like welcome to the WBBL moment uh, that kind of stands out in your mind or a moment from practice or, or anything like that that kind of, um, yeah, really you remember clearly? Uh, I remember my first practice, actually. Um, I was just running around like crazy, trying to like defend everyone, do everything I could. And I think 
I ran into Georgia Jones and I like knocked her over and I like cried my eyes out because I was so scared I'd hurt her. And it was like, because she was like the best player at this point and I was just so scared. So that was my first practice. And I remember my first start. It was um, it was when the arena had just been built. Like it was our first game there, and I started that game. And it was um, we were playing Sheffield, and I think I like tried to box out Steph Gandhi or something, and she pushed me and told me where to go. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I'm not that just stuff like that. I remember stuff like that, and then obviously winning like trophy finals and stuff. That was fun, but but yeah, they're my first two impressions. One of the one of the things that uh, Krumesh told me to ask you about was the first time you played Chantel Handy. Uh, do you remember that? And can you tell me what happened? Why would he ask you that? <laughs> um, I don't know. I think I was just really annoying her because I don't know. I just she was obviously a GB player. I didn't really know that at the time. Um, but she like she's known for like talking her stuff and. She's got a bit of swag about her, so I was just annoying, I think. And yeah, but I did, I, I did. Um, she did score on me, just for the record. But, <laughs> yeah. Did you find your confidence, you know, uh, having these experiences, going up against, you know, these GB players and, and whoever else? Did you find your confidence was quickly growing in terms of, you know, your ability and what you believed that you were able to achieve within within the sport? Um, I think so. I think I, Matt um, Harbour, who was like my coach for the first two years, he always made it a big deal of, it doesn't matter what you score, what you do or anything like that. Don't base how well you're doing off of that. So really, I think my confidence came from how well I thought I was doing. And I think my, the second year I was there, um, I had like, I built a lot of confidence through that year. And then I struggled a bit my third year and then my last year was when I felt really, like, confident and, like, like I belonged in the league. So I think confidence really was always how I felt rather than, like, any stats or anything like that. If you were to give advice to, you know, younger players coming through now about, you know, their confidence and believing in themselves and their own abilities and stuff, um, what would you say, like, what would you say are the best ways for, for someone to be able to cultivate that? Sorry, can you say that again? If you, if you were to give advice to a younger player coming through um, mm-hmm. to give them advice on sort of how to cultivate their own confidence and their sort of belief in themselves, their own abilities, kind of what advice would you give to them? Um, I Like Matt said to me, it doesn't matter what anyone else thinks, what anyone else is playing on another team or anything like that. You just have to set yourself goals. You either hit those goals, you work towards them, and they have to be so individual, individual to you because... The t- like the standard of the teams in the league are so different that if you're on like the bottom place team are going to be different to your goals on the top place team. So like speak to your coach, speak to your parents, have goals that are individual to you and stuff that you can realistically achieve. Have you found it easy to be able to tune out other people's opinions or other people's thoughts of you as a basketball player and stuff? I know we're going to get onto this, but obviously when you go to the States, there's a, there's a lot more of a spotlight on you than, than, than when you're in the UK. Um, but have you, is, is that something that you found difficult over the years or is it something that uh, you feel has come quite natural to you? Um, I don't think I definitely found that hard. That was one of the things that I really didn't like when... Like, say I thought I'd had a good game or something and then someone would comment on it or tell me otherwise and stuff. I really found it difficult because I just listened to everyone and I would take that quite to heart. So I think people need to be careful what they're, like, saying and how they're saying it, especially when... Because I didn't really know a lot of the time what people were saying and it would come back to me in different ways and stuff. And I found that, like, quite disheartening. I, it, I did take it to heart a lot, so I think... Even when I was in England, obviously when I went to Oregon, I had such a bigger profile and there was so much more said to me. But even like through the, my time in WBL, and there was a lot of said. And if I didn't have a good game, it'd be like, well, why isn't she having a good game? There's something wrong like this. And I felt quite pressured to perform every, each and every time. Yeah, it's, it's super hard to... Um... You know, you, you always hear the advice like, don't listen to what other people think. You've got to, you know, make up your own mind and stuff. But, but actually, in practice, 
it's super hard to do. And I, I think uh, human nature in some ways is almost to focus on the negative. You know, you can have 50 people that will tell you what an amazing game you had, but that one person that says something about, oh, you know, you weren't very good at this or whatever, that's the one thing that sticks. And to tune that out is definitely um, a, a challenge. So kind of... Yeah, go on. Oh, sorry. No, go. Uh, it's mainly because, like, when I was younger, I could, I was good, really, because I like had quite, like, I was quite naturally like talented at the game, and I didn't, I wasn't very skilled, so I was kind of good because I just worked hard and did a bit of everything, and because of that, I could never shoot. Like when I was younger, I could just never shoot, and that's something that, like, even to this day, I still like not wholly confident with because. I could never do it, and people would always make comments, oh, she's good, but she can't shoot. Oh, she's this, but she can't shoot. And now I'm just like, even if I could, if I scored 10 out of 10, I would still think, oh, but I still can't shoot. Just because it's been, like, ingrained in me. And it's it's something that, like, I've, like in Oregon, all I did was shoot because we had to, and that's what my role in the team was. But then again, in my head, I was, um, like, doubting myself, I would say. Yeah, breaking those those patterns, those mental patterns that have been ingrained from from a young age is is something that uh, is super difficult to do. You know, um, I think as I've gotten older, I've realised so many things that you know from my childhood or whatever that have kind of that have been imprinted in me that um, that I'm only now still trying to sort of let go of. But I realise they're little you know trigger things or things that you know someone can say and they don't think anything of it, but it really burns. Um, yeah, I think it's a yeah, it's part of part of the the journey of life and uh it's, it's a never-ending process in many ways you know um yeah so at what point did uh sort of u.s colleges come knocking for you and and did you start thinking you became aware of the fact that you know getting a scholarship and going to the states is is an option um i think uh, like my first year with leicester like i spoke with matt about it a lot and we did like uh if anyone emailed me or anything i'd send like a cover letter back kind of thing um but at that point I was just happy like I was like um happy to get anything I was like I got like a my first thing was like a community college I was like I'm going there like I'd picked it and I was just so like this was like three years before I would have gone so my sophomore year of high school what they call it um but yeah and then like my it was mainly from national teams I would get a lot of my interest so it always come like after summers so I, I got a bulk of it after actually after my junior year when we we played in Austria. Yeah, that's when I got the like major offers come in. I was going to say that you know national team wise, he represented uh, junior teams for six six straight summers. I think it think it is which <laughs> um, you know bowl accounts. It's it's a difficult thing to do with everything else that everyone has going on in their lives, and some people just want summers off sometimes and everything else. I guess just to touch upon that, like, uh, you know, why has representing your country meant so much to you or been so important to you that you've done it every single summer um, so far through, through until now? And, and uh, yeah, I guess, like, what does it mean for you to, to represent your country? Um, I think what it comes down to every year is it's a, like it's a nine game tournament and I love playing basketball. So it's like, I like what I couldn't say now. And there's so much about like, oh, no one wants to do national teams. Everyone opts out and stuff like that. But I do it, like, border, like, bottom line because I love to play a tournament, I get, and it's a good level for me. But also, like, a lot of my friends play for the national team and it's kind of fun to, like, obviously we're all on our WBL teams and it's we're with senior players all the time. And it's really nice in the summer to come back and play with people your own age at a level that is still challenging because that's what we struggle with in England. If I played my own age, I like would never be challenged. But that environment of having all the best players, you're playing against the best in Europe, that is a fun environment on and off the court. So, How yeah. much do you think, outside of the domestic season, but you know, looking at that as the, the, your sort of summer season, how, how much do you think that helped with your, with your actual development on the court uh, as a player? Like, would you say that you, you were able to improve as a basketball player because of those international experiences? Yeah, and I think a lot of people, like my coaches that I've had over the years, I play my best basketball with GB in the summer um, because it's a lot, because we don't have a lot of prep time. It's kind of you have to figure it out yourselves and I'm a player that kind of like thrives in that environment. So I I, re I just really enjoyed because it's playing with people my own age, um, 
and we, you kind of like have the same skill level like growing up with people everyone starts developing at the same rate so you kind of it's every year it's kind of you see who's got better who hasn't you're competing against the same people like every summer so I think it's definitely a good way to like match your progress and it's fun so and I think I play my best when I'm having fun and I get better when I'm in a good environment so definitely I like improved a lot with GB. You, you touched upon prep time there and it's it's been a consistent theme with with the national teams over the summer is that just you know the teams just don't have enough prep time to really be to, to maximize their potential I guess to be as good as they could be um, and you know the programs at every level uh, male female every age group would, would benefit from a, a much more thorough, longer, uh, slash more games or preparation schedule to then head into the Europeans. I guess, what's your, your sort of personal take on that situation when you look at over the six summers that, that you've had? Um, you know, do you go into it and think, yeah, this really doesn't feel like it's long enough and I, I do think we could be so much better if we did have a bit more time? Or do you think actually, like you said, you, you, learn, you have to learn a little bit more on your feet because you don't have that much prep time and that can maybe force uh, some acceleration in certain learning, I guess? Um, yeah, I'd be interested to hear, kind of hear your thoughts on it. Um, well, I think I've had a bit of everything. I've had a few years where we've had eight weeks of like training every weekend, four day camps and stuff like that. And to be honest, that year we sucked anyway. So I don't think any amount of prep would have prepared us. Um, but then we've had other years where we've had literally like five days of prep and then we've gone and come forth. So I think that it has to be a balance. Definitely five days is nowhere near long enough. Like you barely get, you have to run motion because you can't learn the plays and stuff in that amount of time. But I don't think you need, like, we don't have enough time or resources or money to do a long camp. So I think like a month maybe of like, you, like Monday, Monday to Thursday you're at home, you do stuff at home and then th Friday through Sunday you practice as a team, like, and then, like, you go into, like, games and stuff like that. But it, it, it is – I think it's more about who you have on the team than the preparation. But then you have to have a bare minimum with the preparation. So, yeah, it's a mix of both. So you spoke about uh, after the summer in Austria was when the sort of bigger offers started coming in from, from the colleges. Who, who Who was it that first – sort of the bigger schools that came knocking? Uh, and what was your initial reaction to – sort of getting interest from the likes of whoever you're about to go through and, and explain to me now? Um, well, I did have a mix. I had, because that's why I struggled to decide what level I wanted to go at, because I had literally, because every, every kind of level want like, offering me. So, because usually people say, oh, you just, you'll learn your level by the schools that contact you. But I can't. I did have that mix, so I just wasn't sure. So I had a few like low majors that I'd go and like be like really good at, and then I had a few mid majors like UC Davis, like South Florida. They were my final three. That they're they're good. They're really good, and I'm gonna have to work hard. But I'll be like I'll play in my freshman year. And there was the big ones like Oregon, like other Pac-12 schools, a few ACC schools that were you're gonna come, but it's up like you don't know how much you're going to play. It's kind of a lottery kind of thing. So, yeah, it was it was after that summer because a lot of the Pac-12 coaches came to Austria because um, the Finnish girl, Awak, uh, she's like six foot five. She's the one that dunks. Yeah. yeah. They, they were all coming for her. And then, um, obviously, like, they're there. They watch games and stuff. And I had a good tournament. So, I, like, that's really where all my offers came from. But, before that, because I committed after that tournament, I committed like two months after that. If I hadn't have played well at that tournament, I really wouldn't have got the high offers and I would have been stuck with the mid-major ones. But that's when all like, the bigger offers came in from that tournament. So, so yeah. what was your thought process around making that decision? You know, you said that obviously it's, it's confusing because you had such a range of offers. And of course, you know, you've got options, you've got options to weigh up. You've got going to a, to a big school where actually they're absolutely loaded and you know you might not get as much of an opportunity to play, but, but in terms of your profile and everything else, it's going to be what an experience, unbelievable. Um, and you'd have to push yourself a lot harder, I assume. Or you've got an option where, you know, you could go to a smaller school, be a star um, and still develop, but in a very different way, different type of role. Like, I guess in, in your mind, 
when you were looking at it, what were the pros and cons that you were weighing up? Who would have, you know, were you speaking to, to, to your coaches, to your family to try and get their input or was it very much your own decision? Like, I'd be interested to kind of hear the whole sort of thought process around it all. Yeah, well, I did most of my recruiting with Steve there. He was like the, because he was in America, he was like the first port of call for the coaches and I would just send like my stuff over to him. But then I had my parents here, but my parents, they're the, like my biggest fans, but they don't know a huge lot about basketball and they really didn't at this point. So them really was like, well, what's the school like? What's the medical like? How much do you, like, how much do we have to pay for? So that was really that side. But, and then... Really, it was really my decision. I could have gone wherever I wanted to, was whatever I wanted to do. But for me, it was just because I play my best when I play for GB, which is kind of the mid-major level. Like, I'd be a good player, but there's other good players around me and stuff. But I just, I did at points find that stressful. And I know in a college environment, they expect a lot from you all of the time. And I really, I wasn't ready to go back into that and be, okay, you need to perform, like, consistently every single time. And if you don't, like, we're going to get on you about it. Because really, like, the American experience, I wanted to, to enjoy it. I wanted to go and enjoy it and have fun. And just re with regards to playing pro after, if I did, I did. If I didn't, I didn't. So I wanted to enjoy it. And I think if I look, look back at the decision now, it was a, I can't say no to Oregon because I've got the opportunity of a lifetime to go to the best school in the country with all what they had. And it was, if I make the decision again now, do I still go to Oregon? Yes, because it was one of the most amazing experiences. But was it the best decision for me? Probably not. But again, I, I don't regret it at all and I wouldn't change it. But my thought process was different to what I set out at the start to be. I think one of the things that, uh, you know, people involved with a game, whether it's, you know, me as media or, or fans or whatever, we, we all forget that uh, there is so much more than just basketball in all these decisions. You know, like, it's a big difference between playing uh, in Nebraska and playing in Florida, you know, just off the court lifestyle, yeah. weather, like the type of people, like all of that stuff. Um, and... Uh, yeah, and I think we every decision is very much viewed from a basketball-specific lens, assuming yeah. that to whoever the player is, that's the only thing that matters, and that's the only thing they're considering. When actually, mm -hmm. there is a whole host of things that 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 make a massive impact on the experience that you're going to have over over the course of of those four years. Um, yeah. So when when you were kind of, I guess, did you do did you do uh, visits? Like, did you do three visits, four visits? Like, did you do visits at all? Or, yeah. Yeah. And so. I did yeah, yeah go on. I did, I did uh, three visits in um, around like October half term of school time in my last year. So I did, and I would not recommend anyone to do three back to back because I, I flew to Florida, then I flew to California, then up to Oregon and back home in like a week. And it was, it was awful, really. <laughs> <laughs> like me and my mum, my, my dad couldn't come up, me and my mum did it. And every, like, another flight we got on, we were just like, get us home. Yeah. But, because um, really, you can't, like, visits are great, but you don't, it's completely different when you actually get there. So I would say only visit the schools that you're really considering to kind of meet the people and see where you'd be living and stuff. But you, you can find out a lot more by reaching out to ex-players, reaching out to current players and players that have transferred, players that left and stuff like that. Did they, on on those visits, was it a case of kind of like rolling out the red carpet and trying to do everything they can to impress you and sort of woo you? Uh, what were those experiences like? Um, different, it differed. There was, I think the schools that like want you more will roll out the red carpet, will do this for you, you'll get this, that and this. Then the schools like, like Oregon were very much, this is what we have, this is what we can give you, like kind of, we're not going to force you to come here, but if you think you want to come here, come here. And that was because I, I spoke to the other freshmen about my visits when I got there, and that was the same thing. So the mid-major schools that are like trying to get these like good players and stuff, they will do everything and tell you anything. But the high majors that have it, and if you don't come, they can get you another one of you just just as easily. They will be more like open and honest. You won't get this, you'll get this. 
take it or leave it kind of thing. What was your experience, like, compared to your expectations um, going into those visits of, like, what the campus might be like, what the facilities might be like, what the experience might be like, how did the reality uh, meet, match, exceed, or uh, be less than the expectations that you had going into them? Like, was it a case of stepping onto campus and being like, wow, like, this is just unbelievable? Or was it just like, yeah, this is kind of what I expected? Like, yeah, I'd be interested to kind of hear the expectations versus reality. Um, all three campuses were quite similar, the schools I visited. So it was a case of I got in it and they had 10 basketball courts. They had a physio, they had hot tubs, all that stuff. And that was a, coming from England, that's a, that's crazy. Like only basketball courts, like lines on a court, crazy. But, um, for me, it was more the, like the nutrition side, the like physio side, all of that was just anything you ever needed was right there. I think that was that was the difference that, like, yeah, I can I can go and shoot shoot twenty four seven on this court, which most teams have, but the like like Oregon had absolutely everything, and they took us over to like the football facility too, and it was just like crazy, like crazy money had gone into that, and they just had everything. They had everything, even like into like the wallpaper was all little ducks and stuff like that. It was just it was something like you you. I can't even explain it. But then again, I didn't go into the football facility once, like went in my year there. So like, it swings and roundabouts, really. Do you think that, uh, looking back, obviously, now that you you know, you know you did a year there, do you think that you end up getting used to those things and then not as like, you know, obviously when you first go there, you're just like, this is unbelievable. Like, this is just mm-hmm. crazy. But of course, you know, after you do it every single day for a, a year or whatever, the novelty kind of wears off. Like, was there any part of you that ever you think, looking back on it now, whether you started taking it for granted and you just uh, you didn't think about it in that way or you didn't have the same level of, of gratitude for it? Um, or was it still, do you think, fresh all the way through the year of just this is just I can't believe I'm, I'm living and living like this? Um, I think some things you start to take for granted. Like, we'd walk in and there'd be another pair of shoes and, like, like it was great. But then you kind of just, like, you do get a bit picky, like, oh, the, like, the laces are starting to tear and I have a new pair of shoes and they just give it to you. Stuff like that, you just become a bit of a diva, stuff like that. But then other stuff, like, I walk into the, like, the locker room every day and it's just, like, perfect and it's so cool and all the lights and stuff, that stuff you still get, like, shocked with and every time we had a home game like you run out with 20,000 people whatever I can't remember how many it maybe 15,000 and you never you'll never get over that like that is something that I'll like I would still love to do every day if I could that was that was something that will stay with me forever yeah how much gear did you actually get like was it just was it limitless like whatever you want or was it limited to certain amounts of pairs of shoes over the course of the year or, or whatever um, I actually, because I actually got my stuff shipped back, and if anyone's thinking of shipping your stuff using FedEx, don't because we had a nightmare with it. But I think I got, I got like like thirty pairs of shoes or something ridiculous like that, and that was one year. But it, it and like training kit, they get, you you need two t-shirts, they give you ten stuff like that. It's just they did give us a ridiculous amount of kit, but it wasn't like. I couldn't just go and ask another one for my friend. Like, if I needed it, they'd give me it. If I didn't need it, they wouldn't, so. Do you think that it was excessive in any type of way? A hundred percent. A hundred percent, but I'm not complaining because it was great. <laughs> yeah, right, uh... I remember going and visit uh, Leah McDermott at, Dermot at, uh, um, at UMass and... I mean, just the facilities were unbelievable. And, and she was still, I think at that point she was in a senior year, I think. But she was just saying, like, I just can't believe just how much stuff we have. And obviously coming from England, I think it gives you a, compared to, you know, whether you, you come through the, for, come through the American system where it's kind of like you, you're much more aware of, like, the scale of college sports and kind of what's available and how much money flows through it and everything else. But when you're coming from England and, you know, basically you've had one or two pairs of shoes all season, which you've bought yourself and paid for yourself, uh, yeah. you know, and all this stuff, like to then go from that to yeah, stuff that you had access to at Oregon is just, it's just a completely mm. different world, isn't it? A completely different world. Um, well, 
even like Sabrina and everything, they, when they got their, their freshman year, they got one pair of shoes, they got one training kit. Like they said they got the bare minimum because they weren't good. Like they weren't good at all. They weren't ranked, nothing like that. So it was because how much success we had as a team, right. why we got stuff. Um, but still, like, for coming from England, I got nothing. So <laughs> yeah, the I think it's, it's Oregon that um that the, the founder of Nike, Phil Knight, that yeah. he, he went to Oregon, right? So there's like a whole relationship yeah. there where he, obviously Nike look up, look after Oregon in a different type of way. I'm pretty <laughs> sure, right? Yeah, because like um. We met, we, like, Tinker Hatfield, like, Phil Knight would come to our games and stuff and in our locker room, stuff like that. So, yeah, there's, there's a huge... And we went to the uh, Nike headquarters a few times, too. So, wow. in Portland, yeah. Were you, were you getting, like, sort of custom shoes, custom kits for certain situations, certain games? Like, kind of, I guess, when, when you think about uh, some of the more bougie stuff that you that you had <laughs> um mm. are there any particular experiences like that that stick out yeah and they did like because we've all got new, like we got brand new jerseys and stuff like that and they made it such a huge deal anytime um we got something cool like they would take us into the back room and they would like do a big reveal like we got like the adapts and stuff like that and the air force the air force ones like the player edition i don't know if you've seen them I think they're down here actually, but um, they like put them in a huge box and like had our number and name on it and stuff like that. So wow, yeah. So we've, we're kind of jumping jumping about, but so you were making the decision, and essentially, you know, when you were looking at Oregon, you just felt like this is just such potentially an out of this world experience. I just can't turn it down. Like going into it, you know the. Obviously, you were, you were number one ranked in preseason. You know your team was absolutely stacked. Ended up twenty twenty draft. Three of your teammates got drafted in the top ten. Just for just for people to have the context. Um, so they're all you know now in the WNBA. Uh, going into it, were you aware that actually you know so you're not going to be able to play as many minutes as you would if you went to a, a UC Davis or whatever. You you know there's going to be trying times where you're going to be stuck on the bench uh, and you're going to want to play. Like I guess what were your expectations going into the going into the season like had the coaching staff sat down with you and said this is what your role is going to be you know it might be a bit of a tough time uh this year in terms of playing time um or or was it a case of well actually you know if you prove yourself during practice there might be opportunities you might be able to play yourself you know into the into the rotation in a much heavier way um yeah kind of how did how did that play out um well, when I first, like, first, they first contacted me, they, they were like, we, you fit our style, we want you, and stuff like that. But our team is completely stacked, so playing time is going to be minimal for the best, like, you could be anyone coming in. And I knew that, like, anyone that I spoke to before I go, I was like, I'm expecting nothing, and then whatever I get is a bonus kind of thing. Um, so I kind of went with, and also being from England, in something that they told me after I got there, they really had no idea how good I actually was. They were like, they were lining people up to recruit over me. Like, I think like Hayley Van Nipp was going to come in and replace my position because they didn't have a clue how good I was. So when I got there, like I, they said it to me, they were like, we, like, I really surprised them that I was actually like good and I could compete with them. So like when I got there, it was great. Like they were like loving it and I like was working really hard and, like in practice I was competing like this is what I've said to everyone like in practice every day I was competing just like anyone else was and um it was I didn't find it really that hard like the stuff I found hard was you can't like if you miss a shot they're like you need to make that that's the stuff I found hard because it was like, like I'm not trying to miss but, um <laughs> but yeah like um the stuff like that was uh, hard but other than that I like I felt like I was doing well and then because we only practiced for really like four weeks before like the season started. And I thought like we had a few scrimmages here and there. And the I think we had the first scrimmage and they put me like last in the guards rotation. Well, not last, like after um, I was like seventh, eighth man. And I was like really disheartened by it because I was like, I thought I was doing really well and stuff like that. And if you ask them, they would don't tell you anything. Like they're like, they don't tell us anything. It's all up to you. But then um, I just carried on and stuff like that. And then, like, the first few games started and I still was coming off the bench, like, eighth. 
but then like the USA game, I played the whole fourth quarter because I kind of proved myself through playing. And I think like before Christmas, steadily, I continued to prove myself, like play well in practice, play well in games. I was scoring like eight points a game at this point. I had a, like, one like really good game. And then I think as Pac-12 started, like all it took was one bad game and I was just like straight back to the end of the rotation and I never really got back in it after that. So I think like before Christmas time, like it was a be as good as you can, like because it's non-conference, not that it doesn't mean anything, but it's that time to like figure it out. I think then when I made like a few mistakes in the Pac-12 season, it was a, uh, we're going with our veterans, we're going this way. And that's, that's how it was. So we had um, Taylor Chavez was on my team. She like came on, shot, like shot the lights out of it. That was her role. And then we like our point guard was, um, she was a great defender, but she wasn't too good on offense. So we had um, my, my friend, my freshman jazz, she came on to back up her. Other than that, like the bench didn't see the floor because they they decided we're going with this in this direction and that's what they went with. So I kind of just had to deal with it, and I did find that hard, but it is what it is. Did you did you find uh, at that time you were still competing at practice and still doing well at practice, but it was just a case of the rota- rotation set now, and no matter what you do at practice, you ain't it's not you're not going to change it. I think. It was like that. It was, I could have, I would have had to do an incredible, like incredibly well in practice to even put my minutes up by five or something. But I think it like, and it's my own fault, but I got to that stage when I was like, well, whatever I do isn't going to change it. So I just stopped, like I stopped shooting every day. I stopped getting there early and stuff like that. And it was just, then they, then they're, they're like, well, she's not trying anymore. So I'm not going to play her. So it kind of got to that. But I mean, by that time anyway, the season got cancelled, but it did turn out like that. I mean, that must have mentally been pretty difficult to deal with. Like, how were you dealing with it kind of off the floor, I guess, outside of outside of basketball practice and, 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 and games? Um, kind of what was your, your, your mental process for it all? Like, were you able to stay up or did you, do you feel like it kind of put a downer on, on everything else, whether that's your academics, you know, your, your friendships, your social life kind of outside of basketball? Um, yeah. Um. It definitely had an impact on me, like mentally and like my mood wise, because it was just like practice, like a five hour thing. You have to get there early, get taped, stretch, like recover after. And it was the thought of going to this like practice every day, knowing nothing's going to change. And after it, it did, it got, it got repetitive. And then it does like take an effect then because you can't complain about it because the whole is, it's how good the team's doing. You could be playing 10 or 40 minutes. If the team's winning, it's fine. And I completely understand that. And we had a great team chemistry for that. But at the same time, everyone wants to play and everyone wants to like do well themselves. So I think, I think there could have been a better um, dynamic with the coaches that, yeah, okay, the team's winning, but what can I do to improve myself and, get more involved but I felt like I couldn't really ask that because the team was doing well so and if, if I ever did ask they just told me I was doing great so I was right. like well <laughs> so it's really hard at that point to be like well I can't change anything anyway because supposedly I'm doing great and so yeah. then this is the way it is but it doesn't feel like I'm doing great in my head type thing um yeah, yeah I mean that must be incredibly incredibly challenging um but like I guess you already said that you going into that season, you knew that minutes could be hard to come by. Did you just think in your head that you would find it easier to to deal with than than actually the reality of it? Like, did you think, oh, do you know what? If I don't play a lot in my freshman year, it's going to be okay. Like, you know, I worked towards that over over the years. But then actually, when it came down to it, you're like, wow, this is a lot harder than I expected to be. It's not a case of just being okay with not playing. Um, I don't know. I think if I'd have gone there and like like got it handed to me every day in practice and like I was really not good enough then I would have been fine not playing but it's when it you feel like you're good enough to play that's when it like starts becoming an issue for you like for you personally because I did go with the that like it's they're like going to be some of the best players in the world I was like there's no way I'm going to compete with them and when I started to compete with them I was you like you get more like hungry for more kind of thing 
So I was okay with zero minutes, but then I got there and like exceeded my own expectations. So then I wanted more, but they'd already said to me, really, you're not going to have that role. So I, whilst it was hard, I kind of accepted it. But then it did get to a point where like, I just wanted the warm up to be over just so I could go sit on the bench because I knew I wasn't going to move. So it was kind of like, yeah, wow. it got, it did get quite, I got quite demotivated, but again, someone in other person in my position could have not got demotivated. There was just me and how I dealt with it. So would you have, de- would you deal with it differently if you were in that same situation again now? Yeah, definitely. Like I would, even if like, cause I said like, oh, I couldn't wait for the warm up to be over. Okay. Well you get 30 minutes of shooting in the warm up to just like utilize that time kind of thing rather than just always like because you, you get the mindset of you just don't want to be there when like three months ago that's all you want the only place you wanted to be so it's kind of a like you start hating basketball because you're just unhappy in general yeah. so I just I would just try and like take basketball away from like my social life and still have fun off the court and then when you get to the court you do it and then you forget about it after kind of thing. Did you were you still able to find joy in in sort of winning the the Pac twelve titles that you did, um, or was that actually a bit bittersweet? Oh no, definitely. Like when we won, like when anything we won, it was ev- like everyone celebrated the same way. Like it was, you feel just like they never made me never like made me feel not part of the team in that way. It was always you celebrate, and it was like fun and everything like that. Yeah. One of the things I'm going to have to skip back real quick because I, ha- I have to get you to speak about this. Uh, your first basket, like, you know, obviously there's an incredible iconic image, which I actually think is one of the greatest photos of a British basketball player that's ever been produced, which if, <laughs> if it was me, I would have that blown up on my wall somewhere. But um, can you recap your first your first college game, who it was against, what happened, and your first basket and what happened? Well, our first game was against the USA women's national team and they'd been kind of doing a tour, like getting ready for, they were qualifying for something. And we were like their last game and they'd beaten everyone else. And it was kind of a, well, we were the number one ranked team. They were like who they are and everything. It was such a hugely like anticipated game. And like, it just started and we, cause we were going into it. Let's not lose by 40 because that was like, that was great for us. And then it got to half time and we were like, we were down by like four or whatever. And we were like loving it. But I think like when I went on, we were, we were just like offense, defense. And yeah, we were just, it was just playing basketball. You don't, I was like guarding Diana Taurasi, but I don't look at her and think you're the best friend in the world. Like I'm just guarding you. And cause you don't, cause you're so in the game, you don't really realize. But my first basket was we were running a play called burst and, um, I, I knew that they were going to like cover down on the other like because we had two options they were going to cover on the other one because they were shouting about it so I knew I was going to get the shot but I, honestly I didn't even look at the basket I just came up and shot it I was so like starstruck and then like obviously I made it and then um, I know where all the cameras are so I knew there was going to be a good picture but I didn't know how like good it was going to be but yeah, my dad's already got it all over his house and stuff, so that'll be one I'll keep forever. A hundred percent. What an amazing, an amazing memory to have. Um, so now here's the thing. I'm sort of obviously jumping to sort of present day. I'm aware, aware of time as I, I always think, oh, we're going to get this done in an hour. And then before I know it, we're 51 minutes in. And it's like, well, we haven't even spoken about the main thing I want to speak about. Um, so coming full circle, that. That photo uh, you post on Instagram with the caption, which I wrote down, living the life I used to dream about, uh, it doesn't get better than this. And, you know, everything we've just spoken about in terms of, like, the opportunity that you are living, the dream that you're living is what you've what, what, what you spent, you know, a large part of your life working towards. Um, and you then made the decision to transfer. That was the, the, the original decision. Uh <laughs> You originally committed to to UC Davis, and then of course, was it last week, week before last, uh, in the last couple of weeks, um, mm-hmm. you've actually announced that that you're coming home uh, to play for Leicester in, in the WBL and and go to Loughborough as well uh, on a three year three year deal. Mm-hmm. 
what went into that decision? I guess starting with like first making this like well first it would be interesting to kind of hear when when you first started thinking oh I'm going to transfer like I you know this I've, I've mm-hmm. was that was that something that happened during the season and you kind of knew you're only going to do one year or was it kind of as the season came to a close you're like do you know what like they've obviously I looked at their recruiting class for for next year and it's like they've got five McDonald's All Americans they've got two guards in there mm-hmm. so again it's like they're recruiting in your position which again puts you in a situation where you're like oh like well if it was me I'll be thinking oh, are they really seeing me as part of this yeah. type thing um or d- yeah did it come at the end of the season and then and then obviously UC Davis uh they were your second option originally so i'm assuming that's why that's why you decided to go there of course with Megan Jones mm-hmm. there be your former teammate being there that that obviously plays into it beautifully as well um but yeah i would love to kind of hear what went into that decision when you made that decision and why you initially made that decision um well, when I made the decision at the time to now, I had like different mindsets. But at the time, it was it was the first thing was they recruited five or like McDonald's or Americans. It was, I mean, everyone on the team, we all spoke about it. We're like, why have they recruited five? Because we at that point, we would have had 15 players on the team. Satu was still staying. Like I had, like still had Satu in front of me. So then I was like, well, I'm just not going to play. And even if I'm not going to play, another three people aren't going to play in my position. So the like dynamic of the team just wouldn't have been the same. But that was the first thing. That was a bit like, okay. But then I thought, okay, well, I'll just compete against them. I've been here for a year. I've got the experience. But then it was just like my parents came over for Christmas. And like I like it was really nice to see them. I miss them a lot. Um, and it kind of just put into perspective like what I wanted out of the experience I was like do I want to either have to work like my butt off every single day just to play or sit there and not play and also they didn't do the degree I wanted to do which they originally told me they did and they didn't do it so that and I I was prepared to like change my degree to stay there but then I was like to like play but then when I was thinking okay maybe you won't play then what are you actually there for? So it was kind of a, um, it was kind of, I didn't know what I'd be staying for if I stayed. So I, and I I just wasn't happy. I just wasn't happy. And I didn't know why, but I just woke up every day and I wasn't like, I can't wait for this day kind of thing. So I was like, okay, like let's move schools. Let's go to, because UC Davis from the start was absolutely perfect for me. I really, really got on with the coaches. I uh, like the schools are really good school. It's in a nice area. But I just couldn't turn down Oregon. So I knew when I left, really, I was going to go to UC Davis. And because um, when I didn't go there, um, Megan, her other school fell through. So I like put them in touch and uh, she went there. But like, obviously, Megan's my best friend. I was like, it's going to be great. I'll go there and have a great time, enjoy myself, get a good degree and stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, that was really my decision to transfer. I just wasn't. I just wasn't enjoying it. Like there wasn't, I didn't hate it. I didn't wake up every day and think I hate this, but I just felt like I was just living. Like I wasn't enjoying it. And I was like, I want to get out of these three years, everything I could. So I was like, I'll try and change schools and see if how, how that changes things. And then at what point did the then switch? Cause that was, so that was in April, I think. And obviously <laughs> at this point we're, we kind of, um, the pandemic is slowly ramping up as well. <laughs> and I think yeah. pe- people are starting to realise that, that it's pretty serious. Um, at, at what point did then sort of the realities of actually, you know, maybe maybe I'll stay in the UK? Like, I mean, I don't even know this, but like in my head looking at it, it's like, well, the fact that you're back in the UK for for longer than you would have been and maybe you wouldn't have been at all if if, if the pandemic hadn't happened uh, and then spending time at home with family friends or whatever you kind of were like oh like this is nice i missed this like uh, it's nice to be home whatever and that sort of planted some seeds in your head about oh maybe i should look into this as an option um but yeah kind of, kind of how did that sort of thought process first start coming about of like maybe i'm actually gonna leave the us completely and, and come back and play in the wbbl well, yeah, that's the thing that like the pandemic has kind of been like a blessing, a blessing in, disgu- in disguise in some ways because um, obviously I, we bit like the tournament got cancelled. We were, in my opinion, we were a hundred percent going to win it. So like that was such a huge thing to miss out on. Such a like so many experiences I didn't get to do. So that was a shame. But then I got to come home and see like my family that I'd, 
I hadn't seen for so long. So it, like everything kind of had pluses and minus. But I do think if the pandemic didn't happen, I probably wouldn't be staying because when I transferred the first time, I did think, okay, shall I stay home? And this was April, this is when I just got back. And I just, I was, I thought about it, but I was like, no, like I'll go back to America and see how that happens. And then um, I went out to Gibraltar, my boyfriend lives there. So I went out there for a few months and I just like more and more, I just thought oh, like, I don't want to get on a flight again and go back to America. Like obviously everyone loves being home and stuff, but it, was more, it wasn't just a, I'll get over it in a few weeks. I just really just, couldn't see myself going back there and for another three years so it was I was coming back because I would have had to quarantine everywhere I go and stuff so I was flying back to England um to quarantine for two weeks to then fly to America um and I just thought on like the last night when I was in Toronto I was just like like do I want to do this have I really thought it through is there other options and then the next day I just like called Russell and was like, like, what could I get if I stayed and what would that look like and sort of that way? Because at this point I hadn't decided at this point was, let me see what options I have first and then I can make a decision. I called him and he said like everything he said and then I got in touch with a few other WBBL teams and then like, a few weeks into like speaking to that and I was like, I decided 100% I was staying. Like there was there was nothing that could have changed my mind to go back to America just because I felt so happy in myself that of my decision to stay. So amazing! And it's, so, can I ask who who the other WBL clubs that you were talking to that you were kind of weighing up options from? Um, I, I spoke to a few. Like there was a few that didn't offer because I wanted to study as well. Like that was a hundred percent what I wanted to do. So Nottingham, Manchester. I spoke to Durham a little bit um, and Seven Oaks, but Seven Oaks didn't have a um, like option to study. Mm. So my like my my the ones I really considered was Manchester, Nottingham, Loughborough. I'm assuming that the history that you had with the Leicester program is is partly you know what helps give them the nod, like your the familiarity. You kind of you kind of know it, and of course like you know Loughborough when you're talking about um, what were you studying by the way. I, well, I wanted to study sports science. Okay. So like, that's what I was trying to do in America. And then obviously I came back and wanted to do sports science. Right. So, yeah. So, at Loughborough, you're talking about the top institution in the country for doing a sports science degree as well. <laughs> so, it, it works out quite nicely. Um, so, it's a, th- it's a three year deal. I guess, in, in your mindset, like, are you still thinking the goal? Uh, when I finish my degree is to, to be a professional basketball player overseas, whether whether that is to try and break into WNBA, that whether that's to play uh, in Europe uh, here. Um, or are you thinking, actually, you know, like, I love basketball, but it might not be the career path. Uh, I want to explore other things. I want to do sports science and, you know, whatever it might be, that, that, that could lead on to. I did a sports science degree as well. Um, like, yeah, I guess kind of what, what's your, your current thought process around it? Because in my mind, obviously, I, tweet, I tweeted out like this is, a, this is a huge opportunity for for the game here. Like we've got a, a once in a generation talent that has chosen mm-hmm. to play in the UK uh, as opposed to the US, um, which has never really happened in, in the time I've been around. Um, and yeah, what an opportunity to profile the sport and, and show the, the talent that, that, that comes out of the UK and for, for younger players as well to see the best playing in their country in front of their own eyes uh, kind of thing. Like, yeah, what's the thinking around the whole process and what are you looking towards sort of longer term? Um, I think, like, first and foremost, I want to be happy in whatever I was doing because the few years before I left and, like, when I was there, I, like, really struggled, like, personally just because I found basketball to be... It was always been something I did for fun and then it turned in of feeling like a job and feeling like something I just had to go and do and I did I like I hated it I, I didn't want to go and train like I wouldn't want to go to summer scrimmages when that's the best part of basketball I just didn't want to go I wanted to, to go and do something else so for me really it's the first thing was okay I need to be happy what, what I'm doing and for that for me to be happy on the court I need to be happy off the court so I was like if I could get a situation where I am going to be happy off the court then like basketball like there's no limit on it I could be happy just to like playing WBL and doing what I'm doing and then not play after I don't know or I could 
be so happy off the court that I like continue to progress on the court that I go and play pro in like a big league or something. So really, I'm not. My goal really was just to be happy with what I'm doing and in the backup get a degree that I wanted to do and get a good degree from like Loughborough's the best place, like you said. So it was more of a let's build a foundation of being happy, being getting a career I want to do, and then basketball will, will go wherever it takes me, kind of thing. That's a yeah. That's um, that's a beautiful thing. Like I think so many people uh, don't put their happiness over everything else, you know. And it's very it, like for you to have made that decision, I think is incredibly brave. Especially when you know there is no doubt. Can be plenty of people that you know. Even when I first heard, I was just like, wow, like I just can't mm. believe that, you know. Like, and I think that that's going to be a, a lot of people's reactions. But actually, you know, to have the strength of character to be like, well, screw what everyone else is going to say and screw what everyone else is going to think. I'm doing, I'm doing what's best for me. And ultimately, that's what you have to do. Like that is. Um, that's what's going to give you the most fulfillment and lead, lead you to a, a sort of uh, a happy life. And um, yeah, I think, like I said, I think it's, uh, you know, the USA's, the USA's loss is, is our gain. And um, I think it could be, could be huge for the, for the game here. And I hope that, um, you know, I hope that, that, that the league and the teams uh, take advantage of, of having a player of your calibre, you know, choosing to play here and make sure that, you know, they profile you in the right way and ensure that kind of you're put on a, on a pedestal for, for young kids to look up to. Um, well, yeah, that was like, because that was my decision to return. And then when I had like got that deal and got happy with it, because I got everything I got in America and more, like from a financial side, from a personal side. So like there really was no reason for me to go back. But then it became more of a, okay, well, what can I do for the British game now? Like now I can, I have the opportunity to play in the, senior women's national team if I get picked because I'll be here for the qualifiers I had the chance to like work and be a mentor with the Charmwood Academy because I feel like they need someone like that I have the opportunity to go and spend time with my family and stuff like that so it's like I have everything I would have had in America here and more so and I know a lot of people wanted to comment and like I refrain not to comment back on some of the things you were saying but honestly like so many people go to America and never play basketball again after and are completely unhappy and I just didn't want that to be me. So Yeah, I think that's uh that's perfectly yeah, it's perfectly reasonable. Um and I hope that people listening to this kind of see it from that perspective rather than making their snap judgments, uh which is so easy to do in this in the world of social media that that we live in, which, you know, in some ways I love because it's allowed me to do what I do, but in other ways I absolutely hate and I think it's the devil. Um <laughs> are you is there any part of you that's uh, have has, has I guess reservations about the limitations the league has in terms of its profile, its growth, uh, in terms of helping with your development, or is it actually? Would well, you know what? I'm willing to take a knock on my own development and my own profile because you know in the UK, as we all know, you're not necessarily going to be invited onto Question of Sport next week, or you're not going to be sort yeah. of on BBC News week in week out and sort of with mainstream press coverage. Um, you know, is there part of you that's like, oh, that potentially could could damage my career, or is it a case of, well, my priority here is my happiness, and I'm willing to take the hit on that stuff, uh, because ultimately I'm happy. So it doesn't all that stuff, all that other stuff doesn't actually matter. Um, I think really my basketball and how big the league and everything will be for me is completely in my hands. Like I could, I could go, however hard I work will like take it there because obviously on the court if I work hard I'll be I'm aiming to be like MVP of the league for the three years I'm here so um the Barcelona side will take care of itself but more like I've got a few sponsorship deals like I'm like like working on and stuff like growing the game and getting into like primary schools and stuff like that I feel like the more effort I put in the more I will get out so I think that would be more beneficial like and rewarding for me than anything else and if because I see like the BBL now there's all these NBA ex NBA guys signing and like London Lions in Europe and stuff like that like why can't Leicester Riders women's team go into Europe stuff like that and like I feel like we've got a good enough team that in the next couple of years like we can probably make it happen and stuff like if I can start it now and then a few other players come back and because a lot of um like Savannah Gabby that class comes back from America soon so 
why not build a base now and we can see how far we can take it. I feel like one of the one of the factors uh, which I think will be quite potentially key in terms of your future basketball tra trajectory is performances with the Great Britain senior women's team, which of course up until this point, you know, like every every summer it's like she's going to get called up this year, <laughs> and uh, and it hasn't happened. Um, is that is that a point of con like in your head? I mean, I'd, like I said, I don't know the conversations. I don't know whether someone calls you every summer and says, "Oh, do you know what? Like we've got a core that we want to stick with, and we don't want to we don't want to mess with that at this point." Um, or is there no communication around it? Like, do you feel like you've been snubbed? Like, is it something that you perceive like that, or or is it very much just like, you know, my time will come. It will come, like I'm sure it's going to come, uh, and hopefully, you know, now that now that you're back here, like you said, you're around for the for the qualifying windows, which is, I think is huge for the team, um, and it's a huge opportunity for you now as well. Um, like no shade or anything, like on GB Basel, but I've heard zero from them over the past few years regarding why I'm not like why I wouldn't get like call up, what I need to do to get a call up and stuff. I have I've heard nothing. And like, I've heard through other people, like, oh, like, we have a call, like, we don't want to mess it up yet. Um, she's going to America, she's not going to be here for four years, like, so we don't want to bring her in now. But that's on, that's through other people, I don't know. And I guess it was, I was, like, disappointed, like, I hadn't made my own age group when I didn't get picked. Like, I did, and especially seeing some of the other people that got picked and I didn't, like, I found that really discouraging and I didn't understand why but it's one of those things that you can complain about it you can be sad about it but you just get on with it because they were never going to pick me so um I definitely think now like like it's 100 percent like one of my goals and I really want to be involved with that but again it's it's just not in my hands so Have if you, I get picked I get picked would would you would you consider being proactive and calling them and just being like I'm obviously back in the country, just in case you just in case you weren't aware. I'm available for the windows, and um, just if you were considering, like you know, I'm, I'm around, I'm available, I want to play, or, or do you feel kind of obviously? I mean, I'm just trying to think if it, if it was me, I almost feel like I'd be too stubborn to even consider that because I just don't know. Nah, like it's their job. Like I want to feel like I've earned it on merit rather than 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 feeling like I need to ask for it type of thing. But um, but yeah, is there any part of you that's thought about asking for feedback and and sort of question and I'm asking for sort of some level of communication especially and it's not like this is the thing right is that it's not like you're some random that has never represented the junior national team and so you're not a part of the program this is someone that's you know mm -hmm. been dedicated for the last six years representing every single age group so there's been plenty of opportunities plenty of touch points that someone could just reach out to you after the summer you know after you make an all tournament team or something and just be like oh by the way like we're keeping an eye on you we, we love what you're doing and you know we'd love to have you in at some point um yeah could you see yourself kind of having that conversation or do you think actually no nah, it's you know it's it's, it's on them um, I think, well, I've had a few, uh, Karima set up a few, like, Zoom calls with the senior national team players, like, Joe Leadham, all those people that are established, and they sometimes don't have a clue what's going on, so I don't think I'm on their top list of priorities to talk to, so I'm just going to let whatever happens, happens. They know I'm back. If they want to pick me, like, they'll pick me and stuff, but, yeah, it's... I don't even know. I don't know who the coach is at the moment. I don't know who's in. I don't know who's in charge above the coaches and stuff. So, yeah, yeah. It's, it, what will be, will be, really. It's, yeah, it's all. It's all a bit of a. It's all a bit of a pretty mess at the moment, to be honest. Um, <laughs> Okay, one more thing I want to talk about real briefly, uh, which I should have done before we got onto all the college stuff, is the Hoodfix All Star Classic because last year uh, was the first year that we did the women's game. Obviously, you were the MVP, and um, I think for me it was quite clear that you know you're kind of a level above, um, and I feel like it was something that I've wanted to do for a long time. We obviously haven't been able to do it for for various various uh different reasons largely because of money um and you know we nike generously got involved and, and allowed us to do that happen allowed, allowed allowed us to make that happen but i would be interested to kind of hear your thoughts around it uh any constructive criticism you have any feedback you have about like you know if we want to grow it if we want to make it bigger better um things that we could do things you'd like to see um i guess and maybe not just around the classic just in general around sort of the women's game to kind of help increase the profile of it especially you know, now that you're back home and, and there's an opportunity for sort of touch points with you throughout the season? Um, first of all, I think like the, that, like the Hoops Fix game for us girls was incredible. Like we all loved it. We were all like 
talking about it before like we're all super excited i think it was like exactly what we all needed and like we like we all talk about it. we always appreciate what like hootsuit does hootsuit does and now hootsuit women like that like that's the main source on instagram for women like for in for women for us in england so like everything you're doing like everyone like really appreciates it stuff like that um and that's the only thing is that day like i think the have it on the same um day as the men's just because more people would have turned up but we got a good crowd anyway interesting but, like, that, you, do you know the rationale yeah. about why we did it on the saturday rather than the sunday my thought process around that was that uh, the the all of the women's finals events in the UK are always on the same day, and they're like they almost they're before the men's game, and it's like they serve as a warm up rather than like the main event. Yeah. So my thought mm-hmm. process was, well, let's not make it a warm up because originally the original plan was put the put the underclassmen boys game on Saturday, uh, mm-hmm. and then do the two senior sort of the under nineteen men's game on, on the a boys and a men's and women's game on the on the Sunday. Then I was like, well, then the women's game is almost serving as a warm-up again. And actually, I want it to be a standalone thing where it just becomes a celebration of purely the women's side of the game. Uh, yeah. And also try and obviously sell it out and sell it out just off the back of, mm-hmm. of, the, of, of the females. Um, of course, like, we didn't sell it out, but we had a pretty decent crowd. I think we were, we were about 80%, 90% capacity. Uh, we had a, mm-hmm. maybe 50 or 50 odd tickets left. Um, 50 to 100 odd, odd tickets left. But, uh, yeah, it's interesting that you you feel like that would be the best option? You, you think that you'd put it on the same day as the boys, completely ram it out, and then make that the, the sort of the big the big f- festival celebration of, of, of both sexes? Yeah. It's just because I know, like, obviously a lot of people come from different areas of the country, and it was more if they were going to come, they weren't going to come for two days, if you know what I mean, for the, who I spoke to about it. So people are coming from Manchester stuff, they're going to come for the whole day. Mm. So it was more of, and then like we like because we i wanted to watch the men's games but i wasn't like gonna go all the way home and come back i could stay at my friends luckily but yeah i think people are gonna come for the get the under 19 men's game regardless like that like was one of the biggest events of the year so i think people would come early but i don't know like we still got a good crowd and everything yeah interesting and then if you if you were tasked with with sort of uh you know, increasing the profile of, of the women's game in this country, what are some of the things that you would like to see being done? Um, whether it's the WBL, whether it's the National League, whether it's the Junior Leagues, <clears throat> WABL and, and everything else. Um, are there any sort of key things where you're like, you know what, I, I think uh, they should be they should be doing this or should be doing that. And I think that would really help sort of push things forward and, and grow things on, on the female side of the game. Um, I think we have to start from like top down kind of thing. Like the WBL, like the men's team, uh, most of them professional, like basketball players, they play professionally. They don't have another job on long side. Women, not so much. Like a really small minority are pro players and the rest is kind of just filled in with people who they can get. So I think starting from that and seeing that there is a pro league, you can play this for and study alongside like I'm doing. Like you can do that. And then maybe that, then that will like, make us way down into the younger age group but I do think we have to start from the top and like get that super established which we are doing like there's a lot more better like more high division one graduates coming in now and stuff but we're just so far behind the BBL that we like when we if we get an increase in like our fans our like sponsorships all of that it's going to make such a huge difference I think we have to start from that way rather than the grass, grassroots getting girls into sport and stuff because, like, you can do that alongside, but everyone kind of focuses all on that, that they forget where they're going kind of thing. Cause, and it is because people go to America. People, that like, there's so, there's so many academies, but then the WBL programs aren't as established, if you know what I mean. So mm. I think, yeah, working top down and seeing where that goes first and then like that will kind of set the tone because also the GB women's team are doing like they did amazingly well and it's kind of just been forgotten about like if them I'm sorry if the men's team did that like men's the men did amazing beat Germany but I'm still seeing stuff about it on my Twitter and I like have seen anything about the women's in like three months so yeah 
Yeah, that's a uh, very very true. It's um, yeah, the, the female game in this country is a, is a super interesting one. I I I flip between yeah whether the focus needs to be on the on the top end or or the grassroots. Like it was interesting the stuff you were saying at the beginning about. You know, if if you didn't start coming to Leicester, actually, because of uh because of the the, the girls leaving the the program that you're with, you actually wouldn't have had anywhere to play. And there is a whole thing where you know, and I, I hear it all the time, especially in London, where it's like girls struggle to actually just get a scrimmage of like of decent level girls, like enough girls yeah. to play five on five. In you know, whether it's you know random sort of rec league organisers or whether it's you know people running elite scrimmages or, or whatever, like. Uh, the numbers always seem to be a problem, so I always think, well, actually, if you if you were to able to increase the number of of um, younger girls playing, everything else should flow from that because there's just an increased demand. Uh, but then on the flip side, yeah, I guess one of the ways to increase the number of the the young girls playing is actually to have more girls playing at a higher level, more visibility, so that they look at it and say, oh, this is a pathway. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. Polly Winterburn is a pro, and that's actually what I want to do, and, and play in the WBBL, and that will kind of be enough motivation for them to sort of follow the pathway all the way through you know yeah because i know like because obviously like getting girls into sport is great but if they have no one to come and watch to like aspire to then they might just choose a different sport like netball every girl plays netball now because they have so like they're on sky sports they have like all that around like i watch netball when it's on sky sports because it's fun to watch like why don't we put basketball on and see like where that goes obviously that like that's not our decision but I think it has to start top down because there is girls playing basketball there is people in it but they just they just get to a certain point and just it just fizzles out yeah stop playing yeah Okay, that's uh, one hour, 20 minutes. That's a, a, a good place to wrap up. Holly, it has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much um, for sharing kind of the, the behind-the-scenes story of, of your journey so far. And uh, I've got to remind myself how young you are, and this is just still the beginning of the journey. So I think in, in three years' time, uh, at the end of your, your Leicester deal, we'll have to jump on another one, uh, see how it's worked out for you, and uh, kind of recap it, and then look towards the next 10 years of your career. So, yeah, thank you so much for, for taking the time. It is massively appreciated. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was really nice to speak to you.